Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, we get a chance to, to chip away at this theater versus scholar thing, <laughs> you know? I think, I think we, 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 we all ought to pitch in on that. Um, and um, I'm going to start off by asking you a question. OK. And then you can ask me questions, too, if you want. So, sure. Yeah, but it's mostly about asking you questions. I want to ask you first about the stunning choices that you made in your recent um, uh, production of uh, Comedy of Errors, which we saw a couple weeks ago when we were in Stratford. Um, uh, you know, this is a play for your benefit. Shakespeare's play imagines a young man, long parted from his twin, arriving in ancient Ephesus, only to be mistaken for his brother, uh, a, a married man of business in Ephesus. So you, that, this means that he gets, mis he gets mistaken for a married man, and, and he has dinner with his brother's wife, maybe more, uh, if, you know, depending on. But you decided to have the twins be man and woman instead of brothers. And um, so we have a young female Antiphilus who lands in Ephesus and is mistaken for her, his brother, married brother. And, um, and, and, and it just, it, it, the play takes so many twists because of that choice. So, and I know there are other choices too, but can we start with that one? Sure. Um so I, I, I'm not a scholar, <laughs> that's like the most intimidating thing about this panel. Um, I came to Shakespeare as an actor and as, as an artist, uh, but was really trans, uh, or, um, transformed and, and transfixed by uh, his text and what it says and speaks to in the human condition. So I love performing Shakespeare and I love the opportunity to, uh, to jump into these roles and imagine them in terms of what they mean to me. Uh, so Antony asked if I would uh, direct a comedy of errors and it kind of terrified me because I had this received impression of comedy of errors that you had to do it a certain way and it's supposed to be like a commedia dell'arte play and you do it and there's like a lot of slapstick and masters beat up their servants and uh, it's it's kind of there's and there's a big fat joke in the middle at the expense of a, of a woman and I, and so I was like oh man I, like I really wanted to do Shakespeare and I really wanted to do Shakespeare at Stratford but I didn't know how I, I knew if I did it and it's a comedy that I had to like love this play, and and so I needed to find th find that for myself within the world. Um, so I, I went and I talked to Anthony. I was like, well, why did you program it? And he <laughs> and he said, well, I love the story, particularly in the context of our season this year, of this family finding each other, and this father going to look for his children, his lost children, and his lost wife, and finding them at the end of the play. Uh, and even though he was looking for them this whole time, and all this crazy stuff happens, no one and the and the brother is searching for the brother. No one thinks that that's actually going to happen. So the 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 reunion is a surprise, uh, and so the the idea of finding your other side in somewhere surprising. Mm. So he's telling me this, and I'm like, well, I can direct that play. Like I, that's that's a play. That's a story that's really beautiful and funny and and lovely. So I went back to the text, and I uh, as a director, um, what I often find you want to do is find that the biggest problem in the play and figure out how it makes sense to you. And so I just identified what the biggest problem yeah. was for me. Um, when I read the text again, uh, the other sort of nut to crack is like, what is the world of the play? And Anthony and I talked about that as well, of like, what is Ephesus? And it's been interpreted like all Shakespeare plays in many different ways. But I, I, I asked myself that question on rereading the text and discovered that uh, the way that Ephesus is talked about in the play seemed quite different to me than the actions that the characters actually take. So Ephesus is described very clearly by the, as this place, you know, full of cunning and and deceit, and you can't trust anybody, and people make you do crazy things that you would never do. But then when you actually look at the words of the Ephesians, they, you know, that their debts have to be paid. Their honor as business people is very important. Mm. Um, their reputations are very important. So I was like, well, say, wait a minute. They're behaving this way, but they're talked about like that. Why would that happen? Who, who does that happen to? And I was like, well, marginalized people. That happens to people like, you know, black people or, or you know, these ethnic stereotypes. So people deal with them, but they don't really want to have to. And so, and so then their reputations become really important. That was something I could relate to as a, as a woman of color. And so then from there, that kind of like cracked it open. I was like, what if this world is full of these people who have been marginalized by a mainstream uh, community and then have 
broken off and formed their own little society where they can live however they want and they therefore need to keep those rules of engagement very clear because their personal lifestyles might uh, defy that. Yeah. Um, and so that then led to, it opened up possibilities in casting and it made it possible for me to envision a world where maybe some of these people in Ephesus are gender non-conforming as well. And so, uh, and, and then I really liked that because then I was looking for a way to not have four men at the center of my, of my play. Um, and I was looking to be able to cast fantastic actors that I love and give them a chance to play these amazing roles, um, but maintain the integrity of a, of a piece where someone is mistaken for somebody else. And so we landed on this design that was really like punk aesthetic because this community would be very punk. Like they're like setting and, and, and rich. They had to be like really rich. Like they, we wanted it to be a successful society so they're like really successful entrepreneurs who are self-determining and 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 you know in, in engaged in that kind of commerce um, and so the costumes started to come into play and it let me audition anybody and I started and then as I was auditioning because it was all kind of happening in this tight timeline I was like I was looking in the text for which roles might be able to be best cast with the different actors that I was seeing and it became clear to me that the Syracusians, the strangers to the town, were the ones that I could cast very easily as women. Um, and that as long as the Ephesian world would allow that gender neutrality in, in their presentation. Mm. Um, and so so then, I, and I started to chase that and it meant for me then that um, Dromeo, uh, I, oh, I also then wanted to sort of cast otherwise as well. So if Shakespeare wrote some roles that you know, or that I was going to cast with women. Maybe there are some roles that were written for women that I could cast with men, yeah. and um, and then allow that fluidity to be part of the story. So we had several roles that were cast um, by men. So I, I sort of upped some of the female representation within the play, and I also changed some of the gender representation. So uh, loose. Uh, is played by an actor uh, who is male, but the character is, uh, I, I left it up to the actors, and within our process, we sort of had a whole discussion around, um, and, and consultants with from the trans community about who and, and what Luce's experience might be. Luce is the kitchen maid. Luce is the kitchen maid. maid who, around who, who the fat joke gets made. Yeah, who the fat joke is made of. <laughs> Recognizing then that I'm possibly not, not wanting to turn the joke into a joke at the expense of a trans person, really wanting to focus the attention on the fact that Dromeo is saying all this horrible crap yeah, and, yeah. and reflecting on her rather than on the person that she's speaking about. Um, and to reflect on her because she's in a situation where, you know, someone comes up to the person that they think is their intimate partner and behaves that way with them and it and it, that would freak me out, no matter who it was, right? Like, and so, so it opened, it opened the, all of those things that happen in the story up in a way that I thought was surprising, interesting, more complex, but very human. The, the goal was always to give the actors that were playing those roles more ground to stand on, um, as whoever they were. So you also don't have a woman pretending she's a guy, and she can actually be who she is, and she can look the way that she does, and still have all of the action of the play play out. Yeah, you have to understand. That. So the two Antipholuses are dressed exactly alike, which is part of the silly joke of the play. <laughs> but well, and that's the other thing too. There's so much that's absurd within the play, right? Yeah. And when you make have a man and a woman dressed exactly alike, so that they can be mistaken for each other, you raise all kinds of more interesting issues than just two guys. I mean, first of all, it's silly that after 25 years. They should still be wearing exactly the same clothes <laughs> and the same haircut. And, but, <laughs> and Completely not it, scientific. <laughs> so you've kind of taken... Now, I mean, Shakespeare doesn't just do that because it's silly, cause he, but he's posting all these questions about um, identity mm -hmm. and about... Um, and twins are one of his favorite ways to do that. Well, and, and uh, Stephen Greenblatt came to see the show. He's like one of the most preeminent Shakespeare scholars in, in, in the world right now. And, and he's, uh, so he came to see my show and then I had to interview him or introduce him the next day at a forum event. Wow. Terrified, right? Like, I don't know if he'd like it. He, he loved the play yeah. and he was talking about how he saw all these things in the world of Ephesus as I'd created that were belonged in Shakespeare's world, like the fact that Shakespeare's twins were were, were, were boy girl. They That's weren't, right. they you know, were, yes. and things that like I, as a non-scholar, I was aware of some of it, but I hadn't really put much significance into it. And I loved that he saw that because it was, in my experience, it was all based within the text. It was all things that we found support for in the text, which I, I think is great. Now, a scholar might come along and say something like like this. Um, <laughs> um, 
he chooses the name Ephesus because it's in the book of Ephesians mm -hmm. that Paul talks about marriage so much and husband and wife are one flesh and so forth. And like, so why, why make Ephesus the, the place full of different people? That might be a, but if he, that scholar, thinks a little bit further with, with what you've done, Shakespeare's challenging all these notions about marriage. I mean, if husband and wife are one flesh, then the wife ought to be able to tell that she's having dinner with somebody else. <laughs> no? Yeah? And so he's challenging these notions. And well, it's possible that he is, right? It's possible Which that is he kind is. of fun. And so the idea that, that you could take the, you know, the mainstream culture and say, no, we're not going to treat this as the mainstream. We're going to treat this as the, as the counterstream. The, and, and, and it's protecting itself from the mainstream. Yeah, and That's then... That's just, I think, and the language is all there. The language is all, all there. It's all there. It's, which is great. And I think the other thing you always have to remember is he sets it in these places, but then you're getting, like, his impression of what those places meant in Elizabethan times, right? right? So, and then look at what's happening religiously in England at the time, too, with the rise of yeah. Puritanism and all of that. Like, it's crazy, right? So, so the idea that things aren't being subverted in, in his actions I think is false. I think yeah. on a dramaturgical level, Shakespeare is a writer writing in the Elizabethan era and you need to consider, or it's helpful to consider what that actually means. But our, like, he's an artist, so he's in relation to that world. He, and most often artists are trying to subvert what is happening in their world today through their art. The right? most successful artist. The most successful and he artist. seems to have had a fair Yeah, I did okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, well, I had two follow-on questions, but we got there already. Can we shift to Coriolanus for a minute? Sure. All right, big shift to Coriolanus. Um, I, I want to ask about the female characters. I think there's only three in the play. Yeah, there are right? only three. And they all have names that begin with V. So I think it's his assumption I'm about Roman, or maybe he's like parents. They want to like name all their children. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Volumnia, who is our hero's um, mother, Caius Martius' mother. And then there's um, Virgilia, mm -hmm. and, so, and she's Caius Martius' wife. Mm -hmm. And then there's Valeria, who's just, what, just a friend? She's kind of hanging out with just the family. A, you know, kind of <laughs> friend, sometime babysitter for... It's, it's questionable. Right. It's, uh, open to interpretation. <laughs> I mean, now... A scholar wants to go for the names right away. You know, I want to go for Valeria. Okay, there's Valerius Publicola, friend of the people, but really a consul or a senator, one of the first consuls. Then there's Virgilia. Oh, Virgil. Oh, oh the one who wrote the... the she, so she's the female version of the, of the epic poet of Rome and all that. And then Volumnia, I'm lost. Because <laughs> Volumnia... She talks me, a lot. She talks, she's voluminous and, and, and she's enormous. She's the she's the mother of all mothers. Yes. Right? So yeah. I want so, your take on these women. So as the non-scholar, I, I, I actually I played Valeria in uh, in my second season at How Stratford. How many lines does Valeria have? I didn't count them, but she had kind of like one scene <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one little mini speech, right? Um, but, you know, it was my second season at Stratford and I'd started to learn about how much scholarship there was around Stratford. So I did go to like, what do these names mean? And I think oh. that's important. It's an okay process, right? I didn't, like, I wasn't very thorough in it because I'm not a scholar, so I'm not as rigorous as I should be. But we're breaking that down here. We're trying to break it down. Um, <laughs> I do think that, you know, Volumnia is exactly what she is. She is a presence, and, and she is a mother. And what I think is kind of exciting about it is the mixing of the personal sphere with the public sphere, and that she, for whatever reasons, is allowed to be a mother in public, and then the impact of that on a male leader. <laughs> like, he's kind of in a no-win situation, right? Like, his mom is either bailing him out, or his mom, he's, he's doing what his mom says. How is that perceived by the public? Or he's, like, is he... Is or he's he, failing or his Or he's mom. failing his mom, also really bad. Like, it, 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 when, you're, when you're bridging those things, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a no-win situation, which is really shitty for the mother, right? Like, uh, and I, I think in terms of as an actor, when, they, when you play it, that's the dominant relationship. You are a mother, whether you're dressed like we were talking this morning, whether you make her a political figure, whether you make her have importance uh, politically in the world, her relationship to the title character is his mother. And when she pleads to him, she pleads as his mother yeah. with very strong text. Um, so 
it, I think it's helpful for her to have a name like Volumnia. I think it does give her some status and some gravitas, right? Uh, Virgilia, I actually, and my, my friend who played her in, in the production that we did before the Lepage production, saw it more as, as, as a virgin. Like fall, uh, oh, um, wow. and uh, I don't know if that's a virgin, true or a virgin wife. A virgin wife, yeah. and in our production, she was a fair bit younger than our our Marcius was as well. So it, it sort of worked that way, and I think her text lends itself to that. She's very pure. She's very um, honest. It's silent and and silent, <laughs> um, and it's definitely a trope that again she's kind of in like what are you supposed to be as the wife? She's the wife. She seems the, the to be the wife that's selected by the. the uh, and I think every production navigates that differently in terms of how much is it his choice, how much is it political, um, what is that role, and how does that person, that actor, inhabit that role. Um, uh, but I think as a character from, from my experience of the play, both in the production I was in as well as this one, is she is a character that's also full of heart. Um, and, that, and the weight that that holds, <laughs> the person with a lot of heart does not actually have a lot of voice within this political situation. And I think that's a critique as well as being, um, you know, not just as a, 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 it's not saying it's right, but it's saying that that's often what happens, I think. Um, and Valeria was, like for me, <laughs> um, I was, you know, it was my second year in the season. I, I did not figure her out. I, I was closer in age to my to the woman who was playing Virgilia, so she was more uh, a friend to Virgilia, who had a bit more social status and social standing to be able to uh, navigate the world. And there was a sense that like Vir Valeria was the was the type of woman that Volumnia wanted Virgilia uh, to be, yeah. um, and yet wasn't. Which then raises the question of why. And actually, Andre who plays Coriolanus in our production. Uh, that that's coming down to the hop, asked me, because he knew I'd played it before, he's like, uh, that whether, whether Valeria was that, was the woman that his, his mother would have actually preferred to him to have wed, and he actually chose Virgilia instead, and I thought, I, thought, I think that's quite interesting. I don't know where he landed on it, but that was well, one I of the questions might, he had. It might come somewhat from the text, as so many mm -hmm. things do. You know. um, uh, early, when, when we first meet the three women, they're in a scene by themselves. Yeah. And they're um, sewing, and Volumnia is pushing her daughter-in-law, um, um, Virgilia, to go outdoors, mm -hmm. go outside, stop this sewing, go out and be with people. You know, rah, rah, rah. and she, she insists doesn't. insistently not. I think we're led to suggest that she's pregnant, maybe, and that's why oh. she doesn't want to go out. But, I don't know. I've, but I've... the thing is. And then Valeria is there, and she's looking after the little boy, mm -hmm. and she's going out with the little boy. So this is where I think the idea that uh, the mother would have preferred Valeria, and Valeria, who is probably connected up with the patrician. Well, exactly. If you, go, if you follow that scholarly line as yeah, well, I think yeah. you know when I saw our, uh, the Page's production of Coriolanus <laughs> overall, I was like, oh, that's what the play is about. I, that, <laughs> I think it's a brilliant production, and uh, and Bridget Wilson, who plays Valeria, is is great in, well, in the role as well. What, that's what a successful production does. Is is, is that it, it leaves you with the impression that that's what the play is all about. But of mm -hmm. course, the next production is really what the play is all about. And then the next one. After <laughs> you hope. That. You one can yeah. only hope. Yeah. <laughs> my I, my image. I shared this with my students a couple of weeks ago. And my image of Rome was always that that statue that's in the. Um, <laughs> What's the big uh, the Borghese Gallery in in Rome? Uh, it's a B B Bellini. A B yeah, but who's the the sculptor? Bernini. So it's the Bernini of of Aeneas with his father, with his father on his back, on his back, uh, and his young boy in his mm -hmm. hand, and his father is carrying the household gods, and the little boy is carrying the flame of of the the flames of Troy. And they're leaving Troy and run, this is Virgil's idea of Rome, and they're running to found the new empire of, of Rome. And the scene in Coriolanus gives us, instead of a father, gives us a mother. And, and we do get the little boy. Mm. And the, the issues are the household gods, and the issue is whether Rome will burn and whether Coriolanus will be burning Rome instead of founding it. You know, so I, the play just, and, and the, 
it's gender that turns the, turns the question in Shakespeare's play. Mother for father, um, um, not, not daughter for son, that doesn't happen. But I think maybe Valeria is in there somewhere for... Uh, I think there's a lot in, I think why I like Shakespeare so much is because he always mixes the personal and the public and, and or political. Yeah. And yeah. often I think that the, those two forces are represented through the gendering of his roles. Um, and so the personal is really easy to connect with, right? Like you look at Macbeth and you go, it's the story of a couple, but then you always put this political thing, or Hamlet, it's the story of a mother and a son, but then you put the political around it. and. I know as an actor, the, it, it's some of the most satisfying text to do because the complexity of that human experience is you get to talk about it and it's like you get to be the smartest and most articulate person you've ever <laughs> imagined, right? The challenge becomes relating the world of the play to now and, and it's where I think gender can really start to flip because uh, in the political sphere, women are more present today than they were in Shakespeare's time. So if you, if you allow those female characters or those, those male characters as written be uh, portrayed by, by women in any myriad of ways, whether they're playing them but they're playing them as men, whether you change the gender and sort of set the world of the play differently, it's... Uh, it allows the, the strengths of Shakespeare to continue, where he's continuing to butt up the personal and the, and the public, but you're doing it in a way that's more inclusive of, uh, of, of the complexity of a female experience, because yeah. we're not confined to the house anymore. We are able to engage in public life. And in, in my experience, the Shakespeare text always holds up to that. It allows it to be something else. You might lose one thing, but you gain another. So there's only three women in Coriolanus, and they hold the domestic space while the men hold the public space, and that's been maintained in this production. There's a, uh, there are a few other women, uh, but they're like serving people within the, the, the world of the play, and, and Lepage has sort of kept that gender non-parody. But in the season at Stratford this year, we've actually done a lot of gender bending or, or cross-gender casting. We did a, a gender parody company of Julius Caesar with a, a, num a number of the leading roles being played by women as men. We did the cross-gendering of character, like changing the gender of the character in Comedy of Errors. And all three productions, and, we, and, and our Prospero was played by a woman this season as well. And it was, it was beautiful to see as that. A, as a woman. As a woman. Not so a, yeah. changing the gender of the character. And I, I saw it just last week and was, I mean, Martha Henry is, is spectacular. She's like one of the greatest actors in Canada. And seeing her and seeing that play as a mother-daughter play was deeply satisfying to me as a woman. Uh, I'm sure there are maybe men out there that missed the father-daughter relationship time, but I'm like, how many productions have you seen the father-daughter? Yeah, yeah. Give it a shot, right? Like, uh, so I think there's lots of potential within the, if we, if we understand um, the forces and, and describe them, think about them differently within Shakespearean plays and not confine them to the sort of traditional gender roles yeah. uh, because we don't have to now. The, there's more fluidity in our world and I think that should be reflected I, on our stages. I came away from, uh, from Stratford this time and these three productions and thinking about them, thinking, wow, we've been under uh, estimating Shakespeare. I think so. The, the language can stand up to this kind of stuff and more than stand up to it, it can actually generate new light on, on the words, on the plays, on, on the verse, the poetry that we wouldn't have if we weren't doing this. If we, and you know, you, you probably can't do this with most TV shows and pull it off, but Shakespeare is really durable. Oh yeah, you can kind of throw anything at it, right? <laughs> like, and, but what's really comforting is you, you do, as long as you're still within the text, I mean, you can change, you it's can nice too, because you can change the text, yeah. but even in, in editing it, the, the articulate parts, the poetry of it, uh, really holds, I find. Can I ask you about Tamara? I didn't yeah. know that you had to do with Titus, <laughs> the Titus Andronicus. So Tamara is a really powerful it's woman It's another character. kind of volumnia, but and not a mother. Well, a mother, she, actually, no, she, very much a mother. But. She comes into the stage, onto the stage in chains and rags and, and wounded, and then watches her son be sacrificed, ritually sacrificed. And the next time we see her, she's the empress, and she's in charge, and she's the chief revenger. <laughs> How did you uh, um, work with So I have to go Tamara? to the world of the play again. I was, uh, it was, I was asked to direct this play by a company called Canadian Stage Company. It's the big Shakespeare in the Park in Toronto. So it was... <laughs> 
It was the first time they did Titus Andronicus in the park, and it was for a, a family audience. Um, <laughs> and I was, a, I had a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, I think, at home at the time. So sure they I, the I went in on, on first day of rehearsals and went, so the way I'm approaching this, I'd like to be able to bring my children to see opening, but we'll see where we get to and see if that's okay. Uh, so I made a lot of choices. Again, um, we were looking to have a diverse cast. Um, I was looking for ways to have gender parity, because again, it's a play where there aren't a lot of women characters, female characters, um, and a world that could hold that. And so, uh, one of the things in terms of thematically within that text is that idea of honor yes. and uh, a woman uh, or the capacity to be a warrior uh, within it. Um, and uh, I, I, I practice Aikido and so I was quite, it, it, it's, it rang as a samurai-y, Japanese-y uh, kind of, some of those, the, the themes within that social history felt true. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, when you look at contemporary Japanese and uh, culture and Korean, the sort of like K-pop youth thing, because it's also a very young play, there's a lot of really young energy in it, mm -hmm. seemed to resonate as well. So what I, what I sort of envisioned in the end was um, I cast Marcus the, the, as, a, as a woman uh, and, and changed the gender of that character. Um, and uh, because I didn't want Lavinia to be the only woman in the play, and I needed the, wor the world to be able to continue after her rape um, in this park version. Uh, without taking away from that, that experience, I sort of wanted to communicate that even, even, so in the original, she's like the only woman and no one can deal with the fact of what happens to her, and that's true, but instead of people fainting and having to leave at that point in the play, I, I needed the action to be able to continue. And so it was interesting to have a woman find her and still not be able to, it's still not okay, but she's not quite as alone. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and, it also, and then it also created a different dynamic of women. And then I also cast one of the boys as a girl. Uh, Chiron was, was a, a female actor, and both twins were very gender neutral but in their he's presentation. he's one of the rapists. He's one of the rapists. But then I was looking at the pictures of the women soldiers who were torturing uh, war victims over in Afghanistan. And I'm like, I want women to also be capable of great violence. And I, want, and I don't want Tamara as the woman who's capable of great violence to be the only person so yeah. you you want to share you want to share the wealth. Everyone can be a horrible, <laughs> violent person, and uh, and it doesn't matter your gender, and you maintain the integrity of the story. Um, so so there was a fair number of other women, not just Tamara, in my production of Titus. Then Tamara herself was kind of interesting because she starts and she's got this army, and and in my mind, like right. got like the the world of the Goths was a. Uh, uh, diverse, uh, so the idea that Aaron was her lover could be open news in, in, in goth world, and her children could be multiracial, like biracial, because she might just have lovers everywhere, and as long as she claims them, they're legit, right? Like, that kind of mm -hmm. idea, so, that, so we did that in, in our world, and she comes on really strong, she had this like, fantastic leather jacket suit thing, she was really tough. She sees the, the murder of her son, and decides that the best way to play this Roman world, and it was sort of like Roman meets samurai, <laughs> the men all in the long skirt pant thing, um, but red, and anyway, it was a great design. But, they, uh, uh, the, but the women in that world were very cute, like the K-pop kind of like the girly girls kind of thing. So she subverts herself, and she changes when she agrees to marry the emperor, and she got all dolled up, Mm. the way he would want her to be, and that allowed her to then, like, kind of pull the wool over everyone's eyes and exact her revenge kind of undercover. So that's, mm. but, but it, was, it was kind of fun to do that, and the woman who played her was actually very small. So she's really cute, but she's, like, tough as nails and, like, really powerful. So it was, it was, it's fun to sort of subvert that as well, and the, what, what are women capable of doing in terms of how do you take on the system and embody that in order to exact the actions of the play? Um, and, and be seen in a more complex way. It also, uh, what you describe here uh, helps me. I like my most favorite line of the play even more now because I'm imagining this queen of the Goths 
uh, trading her costume for the girly costume, and she's short and cute, and she walks up, she, she pulls the emperor downstage and says, be ruled by me. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and we had a bit of an age difference too, so she was older, and the, yeah. and the, 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 the um, uh, Saturninus was actually quite young, so it's also oh. a bit, like, there was a sort of thing of like, oh, I've got this like hot older woman who's like really into me, and he's totally duped, right? Yeah. Like, because she seems to take on all that, to, to, to uh, champion him as the, you know, and she does all that sort of stuff. It was very fun. <laughs> Well, this is our last transition. It begins with a plug for uh, Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday, many of us, all of you here, and some more people as well, will be seeing the Stratford HD video of a two-year-old performance mm -hmm. of, the, of um, the Taming of the Shrew. Um, Kate. Um, wow. Um, what sort of female power does Kate, or Katerina, demonstrate in, in this play. Um, what, what, what should we be on the lookout for on Sunday for Kate? Are we looking at uh, an angry woman, a mannish, mannish woman? Uh, what is she? <laughs> Wow, she, I, um, so uh, in, in our film, one of the things that our, our current artistic director, Anthony Cimolino, uh, did when he took his tenure uh, on was he wanted to film the entire canon over 10 years. We're about halfway through now. Uh, in order to share the work that we do up in Stratford with a broader audience and, um, and showcase some of uh, our productions, because they're, they're really they're quite spectacular, if I do say and so myself. And this is a festival stage production, it's, so it's particularly it's, Yeah, challenging. so it's on the festival stage, which is a, a, a historic stage. Um, many stages around the country, or in, on the continent, and actually in the world, were modeled after our festival stage, like um, the Lincoln Center, uh, the Tyrone Guthrie Theater. Um, the I don't know all of them. There's one in England as well, I believe. But it's 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 basically Tanya Mozeyevich designed it, and it's got uh, a sort of auditorium. Um, seating the way that Roman and Greek theaters did with a thrust stage and the vomitorium uh, along with the sort of Elizabethan, that, that Elizabethan thrust stage with the Greek Roman architectural seating puts the action right in the middle of the space and creates a really intimate experience for an audience of 1800 people every night and uh, so you're, I think, <laughs> I don't know the exact measurement, I think you're like 60 feet is the farthest per distance from this from center stage so you can see them we don't need we don't need to use mics we can you, you can you can hear the, like you're right in the middle of the action and uh, um, this production was directed by a really gifted Canadian director, uh, Chris Abraham. Um, and the the lead, you, you always want to do this show when you know who your Kate and Petruchio are going to be. So um, Petruchio and Kate in, in the production that you'll see on Sunday are played by two of Canada's best actors, Ben Carlson and Deb Hay, Deborah Hay. And they're actually a, a real life married couple. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, they were both fantastic actors before they got married. So they're kind of like, they, but they are a bit of a super couple in terms of just their chops. They're, they're really good. That's been done before. Kiss Me Has Kate it? wasn't done. Wasn't oh. it done with a married couple? At Stratford? No, no. <laughs> on Broadway. Oh. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so Ben Carlson, he's done many roles for us. He played Hamlet in his first season here. He's also worked at stages across the country in, in, in leading roles. And he, his facility with text is amazing. And he can also be a, uh, like he, he plays jerks very well, as uh, charming jerks very well. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Deb, like Deb, even before she came to Stratford, was one of my favorite actors. She is, she is not a mannish woman. She's also probably one of the, sexiest people that you'll know, but not in any kind of conventional way. She's really smart, she's really funny, and she's, she's sort of everything that I think a contemporary woman wants to be. And that's her Kate. She's really caustic, She'll, she stands up for herself. She says what she wants to say. I, I don't know, I see, I, I, again, I, I haven't worked on this play directly myself, but I think the play is actually more about, or as much about class and agency as it is about gender. And the people, the, the other thing that I, I think is interesting with the, uh, with the play is, um, so I run this initiative called the Forum at Stratford, which are these kinds of activities for our audience that runs all through our season. So the last time when we did uh, this production of Taming of the Shrew that we ended up recording um, and filming, uh, we convened a panel of actors who had, or actresses who had played Kate in previous Stratford productions because we've got a fantastic company and, and um, there were like three different Kates that we had of <laughs> like amazing actors. 
not one of them had a problem with the character. Inside the language and inside the experience, the most common um, statement was, I am, this is a marriage contract. Uh, it's for a public. But in terms of the action, so I don't know, in, in terms of how it's articulated, the exact words I'm choosing, uh, you can have issue with, but what I'm doing, what I'm actually doing is an act of love that's been earned and developed and, and between two people. Uh, and that that's sort of the crux of it. So I, I find that fascinating. And I think what it, what it tells me is that there's, uh, there's room inside that character's experience for the most intelligent, complex human being <laughs> depending on what world you want to set the play in. Uh, in the various productions I've seen, they're always complex worlds. They can be incredibly misogynistic. They can just be like frat boy stuff. They can be like crazy, no holds barred wild west. It, it doesn't, it, it's, it's that, that's sort of the, the, the director's vision in yeah. production. But in terms of the gender politics of it, you know, when you have a, str a strong actor in there and there's space for the real human feeling, right? What is the relationship of a man and a wife? And how do you hold that no matter what world you live in? And how can you throw a mirror up to nature and challenge that world and say, how are two people supposed to be, uh, suppo how do they honor that? You know, it's just in the sense of a comedy. How do they successfully have a marriage, you know, a union of two people, a respectful union of two people in the face of whatever world they're confronted by in a public sphere? Well, that helps me a lot. It you know, of all of Shakespeare's romantic comedies, um, this one actually has a marriage in it. You know, it, it really happens, does. It happens in Act Two, I think. You know? Yep. Yep. So um, all the other ones, um, there's talk about getting married, but they you don't, don't actually see it, Twelfth right? Night? No. Got to wait till I've got my women. Mackers. Clothing. That's the only other like couple. Well, right. Mackers and Winter's Tale, I guess, uh, have them. But and, yeah. And where we do have married couples, you know, Macbeth and Othello. Um, not a nice situation, you know. <laughs> so so uh, I'm convinced that Shakespeare was more than just ambivalent about marriage. He was really interested in what it means and what the doctrine is. So when, when Kate comes out at the end and teaches her sister and the, 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 the rich the widow, widow yes. um, the straight doctrine of 16th century doctrine of marriage, straight out of the prayer book, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's shocking. Yeah, I think. And a director has to decide a oh, lot yeah. of things. Oh, that. yeah. yeah. I don't know, I, I, I need to, like I'm not thoroughly scholarly enough with the, with the text, but I do know, I know many women that are fascinated by yeah. it. Um, and, and I actually think there's something in the induction and the casting of the induction that could help. Like the induction. The meaning, induction is the, it, the it's setup. It's a framed yeah. play, and they do great thing with the framing in this production. No spoilers here. You <laughs> have to come and see it. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think there's something because the Taming of the Shrew is a play within this play. How you get into that play can address mm. some of the if you need to, if you feel you need to, it could address some of the gender questions within it, mm. and bring that focus into the marital sphere. But I mean, like, look at, Sh I'm not a scholar, but I know that Shakespeare's, that. Uh, <laughs> no, but like, you know, the guy, like his wife was back in Stratford-on-Avon and was left his second best bed, right? Like there's all that, right? So yeah. who knows? And a cold but, bed too. And a cold bed too, right? <laughs> but we know that he loved. Yes. We know that he had this contract of marriage, that he had children with her. Uh, and, and they suffered the loss of an 11-year-old They saw, suffered boy. a lot and like, and, 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 and there were other options. So in terms of even like recognizing your wife that you do stay with despite this, like yeah. there's a really, there's a, there's a lot of questions I think that he has, but I think there's gotta be a sense of what a true love yeah. is and can be and how it can exist or can't exist within these worlds. I'm gonna put on my pedant hat for a little <laughs> second here. Shakespeare was 18 when he was married. His, um, his bride was, uh, three months from giving birth. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and she was 26 or 27. Um, but she had a cottage. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so anyone in that situation would do well to, to reflect a great deal on marriage and what it is exactly. and how it could be better. Yeah. I think so. Well, I think it's time for people to ask us questions, and, and, and I hope we get to chat after the Sunday performance, because I'd like to... <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So an, another way of putting the question is, how do we understand her submissive words? Do we understand them as calculated to win a bet? Do we understand them as calculated to have a, have a good marriage? Mm -hmm. Do we understand them as, as um, sarcastic? You know, it's, is, that, is that a fair version of your question? I'm repeating it to make sure that everybody heard it. <laughs> Yeah. I think the important thing in that scene is it's a public scene. Yeah. It's a public scene where the terms are very clear. So she allows him to win his bet. That's good for their family, <laughs> right? He owes her, I would say. And how, and it, I think for me, if, if I was directing it, it's, it's, it's the lead up to that in terms of Petruchio's journey. So it's the same way that like, as an actor, you can't play the status of a king. You need other people to give you the status of the king. He needs to give her the status of his wife in whatever world you're setting up, even if that's just in private. So again, it goes to that, that private to public thing, which is what I think our production really did well, because they're really good together. <laughs> um, and, and I think the ones that I've been most satisfied seeing, the productions I've been most satisfied seeing, is where I understand that what I'm seeing is the, par the party line, and what I want to believe is that they're going to leave that party and go back home and have really great sex. <laughs> like, have a very happy marriage and be like really like happily engaged with each other, right? Mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, like that they're, that they're, that they, that they have met their match and that they're only, it's not the kind of relationship for everybody by any stretch, but if you've got a Petruchio who talks the way Petruchio talks and challenges and, and takes action the way he does, he needs a woman who will either completely submit to that, but even then I think he'd get bored and she would get left behind, or someone who matches that, sees it for what it is, which is just a personality type, and maybe has fun playing with it, right? And and it's the secrecy of what they do in private versus what they do in public that is actually kind of like a lifeblood in their marriage. And I think that there's, that, that sort of, that, that's where it's is currently sitting for me, yeah? Mm -hmm. I think that part of that scene in public is where you know, the 
The wealthy widow. Good. Yeah. Exactly. I'm gonna I'm gonna defy you and be different than what you expect. Right. And she, it, it, this whole incident frees her from forever from the character that everyone th yes. names her throughout the show. They can't call her that name anymore. And you know, there are other ways of dealing with shrews. You, you ever seen a, a scold's bridal? You know, you just, you, you put a bit in her mouth and the thing over her head and, and make her shut up, you know. Uh, Petruchio doesn't go down that road. <laughs> he goes, any other questions? Oh, come on, Sam. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I've got a few as I sort of get older, I think. Um, I've always loved, like, the Amelia Paulina type figure in Winter's Tale and Othello. Uh, they seem like the women who can actually say what they think in the world, despite whatever the world is set up to be. So I, I've always liked those roles. Um, they are supporting roles as opposed to sort of being like this, the central role, but I, I, I do love them. Um, and then I've, I, also, I also really love Viola. I've always loved Viola. You too? <laughs> um, I got to understudy her at Stratford in my second season and then just getting that close to the text was also really satisfying. But there's something in the um, spirit of adventure and spirit of loss uh, like that she knows what loss is, but she was still goes on an adventure that I think is a fantastic role model for any young woman in the world. Yeah, mine's Viola too, and it's partly because um, she's the only one in the play besides us who knows exactly what's going on with everybody. She knows Orsino's limitations, and my God, he's got limitations. <laughs> and she understands why she's attractive to, to, um, to, Olivia, to Olivia, and she understands, well, she doesn't understand what's going on with Malvolio because that doesn't involve her. Uh, hmm? No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, and she's not, she's only trying to fool people to, 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 in order to um, be settled about what her state is, you know? Is she marriageable? Is she not marriageable? Is she, uh, does she have property? Does she not have property? Is her brother really dead? If her brother's really dead, does she inherit? Blah, blah, blah. She's got, she's, so she's got to kind of retreat. Uh, but she can't retreat altogether, so it's the costumes, the disguise, which she calls evil at one point, or... or Disguise, thou art the, the, wickedness. the wickedness. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, and, and look at the roles that she sort of cycles through. Uh, she's uh, 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 the grief stricken sister, the inheritrix, maybe, uh, the boy servant mm -hmm. who swaggers, uh, the object of everybody's affection. <laughs> I mean, she is, she's like the. the um, and she's the object of affection as a boy and as a woman and as a eunuch. All, it's true. All rolled in together. It's just, that's what, and because she seems not to have a voice within the context of the play, uh, she becomes our voice because she lets us know everything that's going on. So you know how people that are pushed aside or marginalized, they know more about stuff than people who are privileged. And so that's why she has all this knowledge in the play, but apparently no voice. But then <laughs> I, she gets it. And I, but I'll say too, like, because it reminded me when you were saying she has no voice, um, Imogen in Cymbeline is also a favorite. Yes. I got to understudy her too. Um, uh, and she has a voice. She has like some of the best speeches. If you're ever looking for monologues and like you're a young person, beautiful, beautiful speeches. And I, similarly, like I think, you know, she's, she's someone who comes from loss when she's banished from the, when, when she has to leave. And, 
and still manages to go on adventure and, and yeah. finds her voice. Yeah, I it. kind of misspoke by saying she doesn't have a voice because she does have some of the she best does, lines but she, the play. Yeah. In fact, when she drops the script um, that she's using... In Olivia, using, the, the wooing scene. And she, says, Brilliant. <laughs> and she says, well, if I were to do it my way, I'd woo you this way. I'd, I'd set up a widow's cabin by your gate and shout to the reverbering hills, Olivia, Olivia, and, and Olivia turns around and says, ooh, you might do much. <laughs> And also, and Orsino says, "Thou speaks masterfully, boy." Yeah, you know. So it's she just that does. she doesn't have um, soliloquies. No. She has she has very few monologues. But her diet, like her, in, but, and that's her in action, right? In in her scenes, she's like, she's totally on it. But she <laughs> speaks. She speaks to us in the one soliloquy she yeah. has about no about the her. problem, the knot of the play, and she bandies words with Festy better than anybody. Yes. Yeah. Which I think is a mark of her oh, yeah. verbal ability. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, so we, we'll see you all on Sunday. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the great questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, Hope to see you in December when we're back uh, for the show for Coriolanus as well. Yes. <laughs>